and uh, of course Alessandro, who who is also our link, and I would like to to mention them to the Milano group, who is also working on, on play and games from different perspectives, but in a very complementary manner, and we change a lot. So we are very happy as, as a research group to see this research group widening and, and because we need these exchanges, the, the topic is extremely complex. For today, as, an, as you give me the honor to, to open this, this morning, I will try to have an overview, but really this is food for thought. This is nothing carved in marble. On the contrary, this is work in progress. And I would like to propose a reflection comparing text uh, archaeology and images because during these past three years many things happened many things um, became more clear but we are we are not we are not yet at the end and I will, would like to share this with you because we, you will go on with these topics during the day so my my talk will, will address three 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 perspectives first warriors at play past and present views in a historiographic perspective we will see how how the topic was addressed until now. Greek and Roman evidence, comparing so Greek and Roman, what changes or not, and then children playing warriors. Uh, Alessandro introduced you the, the project, so I will not, not uh, elaborate too much on it. The important is that we, are, we, we have a pluridisciplinary approach. That's the main thing. And that's why we, we need to be as many as we can comparing written evidence, archaeology, iconography. We soon have uh, an anthology. We already have a publication of Pollux, the, the games. We have already publication also on these topics of education and Roman towns, East and West. Alessandro has completed a beautiful study on, on Pompeii, but we, we go on with F. Tukia and others about liminal places, as well as in, in the construction of social identity in iconography. We can come back to that in the discussion, just to give you a glimpse, because that's the aim also of this meeting, so that we know who is doing what. <laughs> uh, we had a, an exhibition in 2019 with a catalogue. If you want to have it, just write to me. I send you the PDF. It will be open access in June. And uh, Giulio Polucci is already open access, so that's the edition. And we had also a number of books. Uh, one is just already out, Heraclit, Le temps est un enfant qui joue. They are always multilingual. With Marco Vespa, Bon ou Mauvais Jeu, this, 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 this topic of sociability that I will also discuss here, but also discussing the materiality here with a very nice paper of Alessandro Pace and other members of the team, F. Tukia, F. Tukia also, and, and others on, on dice, and unusual dice and in Archimed about multiculturality. We have an online webinar that you can join. We, we soon finish the term, but we will start again in, um, in the autumn. What is in press are a number of books too on play and games, this question of definition, also, Barbara Carey will join us, or maybe has already joined us. We are publishing with her back to the game, the, the proceedings of the 2018 conference in Athens. And there I, will, I will mention some papers there that, that, that will appear. And, and we are discussing with Tiffany Aziza this question of violence. So you see that warriors, in fact, are not, not very far away. But what is very interesting in a, in a historic historiographic perspective is to see either the focus on pais, paideia, childhood, education, there is a very strong focus, or play and games are in, included within a discussion of sport, uh, as in this catalogue. We have many catalogues, and, and we did one as well, because this is a topic that really is good to address a wide audience, and to make a wide audience aware also of antiquity and the importance of antiquity. But beside uh, childhood, there is much more to do, of course, about another view, which is that the, we developed today, the, the warriors one. And the warriors one, I, I will start with, with this one because it is impossible not, not to comment it. And I know that Lucia Romero and um, maybe Marco, we, we will come back to that. We cannot come, not come, it is, a, it is a basis. It is a true success story because we have over, 
over 168, I would say about 200 vases now in the archaic period. And this means something, of course. The key one is that by Ixikias, because of, of for many details, including the fact that we have numbers and the numbers probably show that they play with dice. And just to show you that so many people have addressed this piece because it is a masterpiece and as all masterpieces, it can be read in different ways. But you must know that in 2018, there was an exhibition in Zurich uh, associated with a conference, which is now in press. And I will give you very quickly a few words about what can be said about this iconic image. Because this iconic image in this reflection about what is shown, what is described, what is materially evidence, it is very striking. We have no text, you know, we, we have been, generation of researchers have looked for that text, but Klaus Juncker has shown that this is one of his pseudo Homerica, that you don't need one. And I developed the fact that, and also in Exequias, that this is an iconic image. And I will show you in which way this is iconic. There is no text, no, not, this is not necessary. It was long believed that we were forgetting duty. And for instance, um, Sarah Morris and John Papadopoulos illustrated this very nice picture of Russian soldiers playing a board game. Is it the same or not the same? I don't think it is the same, though it was much elaborated because they are not forgetting duty. It is just the opposite, not forgetting the, the noise of the war. You have pictures of soldiers around, but I think it is as on a game box. It is, it is a way to show what it is about. This is about war. The game is about war. And it is about war because it has to train strategy. If they had had chess, they would have played chess and they play self-control. And looking at the written sources, it's, it is very present through the story of Palamedes in Philostratus, that Palamedes invents Petea. It is not frivolous. It is a shrewd and serious pastime, but it is a pastime. Or in the anthology, where really the board is like is, is really like the, the place where you have war, but it is the war of friends on a wooden field. So we are in this virtual world, which is the world of, of games. And Plato has this, uh, and you find it in so many texts, has this image that you must train to control yourself. Um, and the comparison is as in the fall of a dice. Huh? And not only you must not do like the children who are clapping one's hands to a stricken spot, wasting the time in wailing, you must know how to address the fall of dice. And then even reverse the result, huh? as it would, you must deliberate as it, it were in the fall of a dice to determine the movements of our affairs with reference to the numbers that turn up in the way that reason indicates would be the best. So you must learn to control control what is falling, like the falling of a dice, what is happening. And this is what they show. And this is most likely why this image was so much like, because it tells that. It tells that these warriors manage uncertainties and manage the hazards of war. And again, Philo of Alexandria speaks about it. So much to human affairs, twist and change, go backward and forward as on a, the game board. Roberta Maillon, in her work on why we play, elaborated on that. She says, playing aims at acting upon, as the view of an anthropologist, what must happen. Playing by, by its structure allows people to overcome the undetermined. And that's why we are always making gestures because the game is never over, it's always on. It is the image of its uncertainty. And maybe that's why you have Athena. For, there are different reasons why she's there, but one reason is that she's moving her arm to say, and looking at one of the warriors, to say, one of you will win, just to indicate that there is an end to come. We don't know yet which one, but there is one to come. The aristocratic and civic, we come to status and, and now and we'll have a look in a moment at, at material, is very important, the aristocratic and civic value, because you have the two equals, Achilles and Ajax, so the best friends, so that it is a true argon. And in, in the coming paper, in the forthcoming paper, 
uh, already described it in 2015, you see they, it's a kind of dexiosis we are having because it is a way to show that there is this fellow feeling between the two. This is no war, though it is about war, but there is no war. And in fact, as you know, in a war among soldiers, it is the best if each other knows each other very well and you know how the other will react in case of difficulty. So it is even, it is even crucial. There is this notion of uncertainty, and of course the notion of uncertainty as a literary topos leads to the fact that the gods will decide the issue with dice. This comes back many times in literature. Uh, Zeus throw is always lucky, and we know that Palamedes dedicated the dice in the temple of, of Tuke. And that's why many, many authors uh, looked at this religious perspective, that in fact they were not playing, they were just taking an oracle, but I don't think it works. I think it's more as Roberta Mano described it. It is that play, as it has to do with undetermined, then it is very, very contiguous with divinatory or proprietary practices. We are also structured, structured as games. And that's why she says the act of playing is willingly seen as being somewhat augural. So maybe there is there is an ambiguity, but, but basically uh, they are playing. And in fact, this play is such a pleasure, aristocratic pleasure, and uh, we can come back to that. And in Athens, looking at these warriors playing who are Achilles and Ajax is also a way for the, for the citizens to feel like hero heroes. And this is also something interesting to, to do. Uh, and Pindar explains how in the afterlife somewhere you take delight and not in any, in any pleasures, horses, sport, peteia, music, and very smell. So a very beautiful surrounding. Very often we have compared this evidence in the, the pictures with terracotta models of board games found in tombs. Uh, there are about five, most likely there are more, much more, not dozens, but more, and already five are, are a lot. This one is from Vari, and uh, you see the mourners, so it is clearly a double. It's not the proper board game, but it is a double that you place in the tomb. The one from Vari, Vari was broken, was in the offering trench, which is a, an important point. In the Keramikos, you have another one. Maybe the mourners are not well placed. Maybe they were also looking the game, and we think, of course, of the description we have in the anthology, saying that the war is like the board. But one should be careful, and I'm happy to see that Vicky Sabetai has joined us. Uh, of course, status is the, is the first point. But nevertheless, we should address, because we discuss warriors, what is the sex of these warriors, male or female, in any case, for the tombs. There are a few doubts about the, the, the gender of the owner of that tomb. And Vicky Sabetai has, has addressed this question in, in, in a paper published by um, Elisabetta Tsingarida, um, and uh, where she shows that in the trench, you had also a broad broken Lutrophorus, Hydria, ritually broken before burning on the pyre, and you have even mourners also on, on the Lutrophorus, and that this is an indicative of a female tomb. We must be very careful, but we must open our minds and think that women also did play, and Vicky Sabetai has a paper in the forthcoming BGS uh, book where she shows that in the Boeotian tomb, archaic period, a woman had dice and counters in, in so implements, gaming implements in her tomb. And this should not surprise us because if we look in Egypt, in Egypt, this is not a problem. If you talk to an Egyptologist, of course, Queen Nefertari is playing Senate, and uh, she's a queen, so women of powers. And one of the oldest remains of, of, a, of a game uh, comes, it is also a model, and it comes, we know, from the, well, the tomb of a wealthy woman from Nakada. And very recently, I found out that in Cyprus, third century BCE, there is a board game with, uh, and you see it's a um, sort of a pentagram but with 11 lines, there are names and names of the women. And these women have ethnic names, Sidonia and so on. 
And um, Nicolau wonders whether it could be the wives of the mercenaries who were, who were in Cyprus who have similar ethnic names. So just to say that you, you can have this, this view. Palamides' invention, I will not to be too long, Marco Vespa has written already about it. It's, it's, it's striking to see how in Greece there is a focus on this civilizing civic value and the invention of Palamides is to prevent stasis in the army. So Focles says that he discovered the cleverest ways of passing time for the soldiers. It is a remedy against idleness. And it is not just idleness, it is really stasis. What, what happens if soldiers are not busy and they are busy also with a, with a serious game so working on strategy and all the values I, I, I described before. Aristotle uh, um, explained this civic dimension of play mentions it huh? for instance when he says that somebody who is isolated is like an isolated pieces of a board game. So again, this, this reference to the Peteia. And the same in, in Plato, the Pla Plato explains how in Technai, the, it includes arithmetic, it includes geometry, and it includes Pesos games. So this is something very structuring and having to do with civilization. And here again, you will have a very interesting paper of George Bakewell in the BGS 2021. And there is one also of La Barriere about this notion of our police and police and Peseya. We should not um, let us forget these pictures. Uh, they are no warriors, but they are citizens, again men, and this is very striking. If we think of the presence of women as players in tombs, it shows us how much if we focus only on one source of evidence, we are cheated by the evidence because there are also women who, who were playing, especially in the tomb uh, of Beosha where everything, all the implements were kept in, in, a, in a similar vessel. Uh, just to finish with this image of a police board as being the image of a town and the image of political order. This is so very strong in, in Greek sources, in the Republic, where even the guardians are described as being uniform, homogeneous, and they are compared even to, to counters. And you know that counters in antiquity, and this is something very crucial, they are all the same. It's not chess that's the revolution of chess, but you have different, different types of, of, of counters. And in Euripides, and I will, come, I will refer to it about Rome, there is a discussion between Theseus and the Theban herald. And Theseus compares, in fact, Athens as the game of polis, where all pieces are equal, while the Theban herald says, you, he, you give me here an advantage, just as in Pesoi, for the city from it has come, is ruled by one man only, not by the mob. So there is a contrast between a city like Athens, which is just like the game of police, and other cities with other type of ruling. Leslie Kirk had interesting reflections about that, saying that the board game is like a city, police, and the city is like the game. But uh, one should stress that Peteia and Cubeia can be ambivalent in the context. You all know the story by Herodotus, where, where uh, he explains how Pisistratus won Athens again, because the, the warrior from Athens, the man from Athens, had after, after breakfast had, had started dicing or sleeping. They were attacked by Pisistratus men and put to flight. And it's really Cubeia that we were doing. And Marco has a paper in Palace that you can read on the FNFAS de la Cubeia. When it is with dice and, and gambling, then it can start to be, to be bad. I pass to Hellenistic, Hellenistic military leaders. We see um, a change. We see a change in the sources. Uh, happen anecdotes having to do with famous drinking for Philip of Macedon, who liked to, to play a, a lot. And uh, not only was he drinking, throwing dice, when one of his uh, friend Antipater came, he pushed the gaming board under the couch. So we feel um, this notion that it's, it's shameful to be, to be found playing. But Alexander, when he was very ill, he liked to spend day at dice. So it, shows that again this notion of relaxation is still there but the best example is Demetrius. Demetrius you know he was first king of Macedon, king of Macedon in 2094, he was captured and during 
during his years of captivity, three years of captivity, Plutarch describes how he started to, to take to drinking, to dice. He spent most of his time at Vise, and he had sought in arms and fleet and armies to find the highest good, but now, to his surprise, had discovered it in idleness and leisure and repose. So we see the change. And when we look at Roman views, where are the warriors? It's very striking that they disappear. Or, um, what, what was already present some, somehow in Greek sources about, for instance, the condemnation of Palamedes becomes very strong. Gambling, dicing, these are misbehaving soldiers. As a change, I give you the reference to Strabo, who described how Polybius in the capture of Cor described the, cap the capture of Corinth and, uh, and, and resent that they were um, taking paintings, works of art, and among these paintings that were very famous, they were put on the ground and soldiers were seen playing dice on these. So it is the, the maximum of, of be misbehaving and for emperor warriors, it is synonymous, it is used as a synonymous of weakness, of disease. As we know for Claudius, he was fond of gaming, he even published a book upon the subject. Very interesting case, Claudius, because his life also was like a game, because he, he, he should have died, he was not, he was not killed, well, he, he, had, he was already born different. So his whole life is, is uh, aléatoire. So uh, it's not a surprise that he likes so much uh, dice playing. But the bad emperors, really all of them, and I cannot show them all, gambling is really a topos, as in Historia Augusta. is always juxtaposing being a glutton, so food, being a ga ga gambler, and then we have circus or gladiatorial arms. The same for Varus, he used to dice the whole night through, font of charioter, held gladiatorial bouts rather frequently as his banquet. So reckless gambler. And in images, we, we are the warriors again. What we see is sociability, the connection with wine, with food, with entertainment, and is in the Xenia mosaic. Uh, usually we only see the extract, but it's part of a whole panel. And the whole panel shows well that this is part of the pleasures, the pleasures of a banquet. And this is very important. Gambling comes back all the time, uh, as in Pompeii, or on, in Tunis on the, it is the circus, but perhaps gambling about charioters who will win, yeah? because again, the panel here is inserted in, a, in a larger in larger panels, or it is part of the image of the wealth of a town, as in the Megalopsychia mosaic in Antakya Museum in Antioch, where you know you have this frieze, and when you want to show a wealthy town, you show people playing and playing for money because Megalopsychia is in the middle and she's holding coins and they are playing maybe for money, but it's a place where you have money. Just a glimpse as other pictures of play in the Roman period and still no warriors. It's another kind of strategy. We think of Ovidius where he compares war with the Lantrunculi, huh? with, with the play with a woman and how men and women can, can have strategic relationships, but in order to seduce each other and as on this, uh, on this monument, funerary monument. The idea that he's still there, it is that the board is the place symbolizing the war, the, the field, the war field, and that the counters, and it's still there, are other soldiers. The name of La Trunculi itself, of course, comes, comes from mercenary and marshal in, in, a, in, a, in an epigram. So if you play the war game of stealthy mercenaries, this class fellow will be your soldier and your enemy. And you have this beautiful gem in a ring. Who was wearing it? A powerful man, perhaps somebody like Piso, you know, Piso who was put to death in 65 because he wanted to be the, the emperor uh, to, to replace Nero and he didn't manage. And in his description, it is said that he, he liked to, to, to play La Trunculi and like a good chess player, crowds flock to watch him play. This is rhetoric, of course, but a very interesting rhetoric because at the same time, it is said that he acted tra tragedies in stage dress. So he's not at all 
corresponding to the standard of an aristocrat of the time. And in the same sentence, he's playing La Trunculi, but you must know that he, what he was missing when he was trying to take on power uh, over Nero is that he had no war. He was not a soldier. So he becomes a soldier, and I will, will not read it all, in the panegyric of Piso, in his play, he becomes the general that he has never been. So the game replaces the performance as a real warrior, and we know it failed. So where is where is where are the soldiers in depictions? They are in the material. In fact, they are they are on on the board itself. In as here on this uh, in the in the. In the um, in the objects that accompany the play, as on this tower, where it is written, pictos, victors, hostis, the letter, you know, this, 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 uh, these sentences, where, where it is really about the pigs defeated, the enemy wiped out, play without fear. And it is striking to see that the games are really about, uh, the games are really about the war. Huh? La force de l'empire, uh, the strength of the empire, the enemies um, are, vanquished, the Romans are playing. And Chamber, uh, Peter Chamber has compiled all of these, uh, and it's very interesting, but it's always the same discourse, pacify the nation, Roman play on, the enemies beaten, you rejoice Italy. So the, 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 the war is really on the board, and this has not changed, but you no more show it for different reasons. There is even some oracular board games, some or some oracular dimension, in, as in Proculus when he was playing La Trunculi, he he was called out as imperator, and he has become an imperator. So there is still that. If I look at uh, archaeological evidence, the distribution of board games in military camps, here I don't show you the Greek ones because we have some in Greek fortresses. So this is also a continuity. Uh, Alessandro has a paper just out in 2020 in Archimel about playing with, Bat with Batavian, um, uh, about this evidence, uh, the same for um, Tim, uh, Tim Penn and um, and courts about Roman evidence. And so we find them everywhere. I would not show them everywhere, but here it is striking that along, along all this period, this is a continuity. Children, I will, I will conclude with children playing warriors very quickly. Uh, I like this postcard. You see the children and so it's of course the first uh, world war, children are playing chess and you have this heroic image in the background. Maybe as you had here, this comes from, these three come from the tomb of a child. You may recognize the image of Achilles and Ajax, so maybe transmitting the same notion, the same values for the child. This one comes also from the tomb of a child also in the Kerameikos, and we know from Plato that it was good to train playing games with counters and dice, and it was even good to train early because you, you should really do it seriously. It's good for, for the mind. And so training to be warriors at play, we find it in children's mimetic games since all, all times. In Philostratus, for instance, a young Achilles at the age when other children want toy wagons and hamakes and knuckle bones to play with, well, he was trained with spares, javelin, and running. He was in the baby talk phase of training for war. And it goes on through the ages, as in Suetonius, it can lead to death, where Rufrius Crispinus was playing being a general and an emperor, but of course, Nero asked him to be put to death. And we have the same for Septimius Severus. I will not be too long. Um, Aurel, I will conclude with Aurelianus because it's very strong, uh, very strong uh, anecdote. Theoclius wrote of the reigns of the Caesars that in the Sarmatian Aurelian with his own hand slew 48 men in a single day and then goes on with 950, so that the boys, and the terms are really pueri, composed in his honor the following jingles and dance ditties to which they would dance on holidays in soldier fashion 
and it is a terrible song. Thousands, thousands, thousands we have beheaded now. On one alone, a thousand we have beheaded now. He shall drink a thousand who a thousand slew. So much wine is owned by no one as the blood which he has shed. It's an amazing story, but it shows uh, is here so children could incorporate the violence of war by play and playing so warriors. So to conclude from Greece to Rome, what changes? Is this the change of medium? We have no more vases and maybe that's the question of a medium, not just of ideology. Of course, there is a change of ideology because this one we have seen, it's really rooted in aristocratic uh, context. And then in the democratic context, we have the police and all the text about the police, but no more pictures, no more pictures about police. And then from democracy to principate and imperium, of course, all this idea of counters as being the soldier, it, of course, it must evolve because now we have one leader huh, with a principate and imperium, but whatever happens, war is still at play on the board and even in the board implements. And I thank you very much for your attention.